Hello and welcome to a summary of all you need to know about the poem My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. I'll explain the meaning related to this poem as it appears in part 3 of the Pearson Edexcel International GCSE Anthology. Now, do bear in mind that, in contrast to part 1 of the anthology which featured only non-fiction texts and part 2, which was a mix of fiction and short stories and poems, part 3 of this anthology exclusively features poems alone. So in this video, I'll highlight key language and literary devices used in this poem and you'll learn how to analyse it. So let's get started. Now what I'll do is I will read through bits of this poem and stop every so often to point out important literary techniques. So let's begin. Ferrara. That smile like Duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I'll call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day and there she stands. Will please you sit and look at her? I said. Fra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance the depth and passion of its earnest glance, but to myself they turned, since none puts by. Now I'll stop there initially. So the title is really, really interesting because essentially what this does is it highlights and shows us that this poem is about the Duke's previous wife. Now, who is the Duke? This is shown in the title or the subheading Ferrara. Now, bear in mind that Ferrara is an Italian province. Now, contextually, the Duke that's being talked about and alluded to by Robert Browning is Duke Alfonso of Ferrara, whose first wife, Lucrezia de' Medici, the Duchess of Ferrara, died under very suspicious circumstances, and many believe that he actually poisoned her. Now, this poem is written as a dramatic monologue, so in terms of its structure, it's written as one whole stanza. And essentially, what this dramatic monologue is, is this duke essentially confessing, not showing any type of guilt or remorse, but confessing to killing his last duchess. So, in line number one, he begins, that's my last duchess painted on the wall. Now here, this repetition and reference to my last duchess refers to the duchess who's going to frame what he's going to talk about in the poem. Now, the use of the possessive pronoun my shows that already from the outset, the speaker, the duke, sees the duchess as a possession that he owns and only he has the power to show her off to different people. Now, he then mentions in line two, looking as if she were alive. Now, this simile is very ominous and this simile is quite powerful because we sense already from the outset that this duchess might be dead. Now, the caesura here, after alive, gives us pause for thought, again, further emphasising whether that this woman might be dead. Moreover, he mentions I call and there's enjambement here and following on in the next line there's enjambement and what this does enjambement generally in a poem is it speeds up the pace of the poem so the speaker the duke is speaking without pause he's just speaking really really rapidly now he references Fra Pandolf and what he's doing here is he's referring to a painter and Fra Pandolf is allegedly the painter who painted the Duchess however do bear in mind that Fra Pandolf actually never existed he's a fictional character but the Duke of Alfonso and the Duchess of Ferrara Lucrezia de Medici they did actually exist now in line five he asks well please you sit and look at her now, the rhetorical question here is actually not really a question, it's more of a demand. The Duke realises and recognises that he has the power over who can see and admire her beauty and the person that he's speaking to, who we don't know as yet. He's basically commanding him to sit down and just admire this beauty of the beauty of this woman. Now, in line six, he mentions, again, Fra Pandolf by design. And the repetition of Fra Pandolf shows the Duke's arrogance. He wants to show off how important he is that such a famous painter painted his duchess. Now, in the following line, he alludes to strangers like you. So what this is showing is that the person that the Duke is speaking to is a guest that aren't really well acquainted. However, he's carelessly talking about his duchess and he's showing her off to this person. Now, he refers to the depth and passion of its earnest glance. Now, what this is doing is describing the real beauty and innocent appearance of this duchess that, of course, captivated the duke. Now, he then emphasises in parenthesis, since none puts by, which I'm going to develop. So he mentions within the parenthesis, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you, but I. And he closes the brackets here. 
however I'm going to continue and seemed as they would ask me if they durst how such a glance came there so not the first of you to turn and ask thus sir it was not her husband's presence only that called that spot of joy into the duchess's cheek perhaps fra pandolf chanced to say her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat such stuff was courtesy she thought and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy she had a heart how shall i say too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on and her looks went everywhere. So as I mentioned, he's opened the brackets above and then there's the closing of the brackets. Now within the parentheses, he talks about the curtain. Now what this shows is the Duke completely controls who can and can't see the Duchess. Now, when the bracket is closed here by Robert Browning, the end of this parenthesis, what this does is that it's emphasizing how the Duke relishes his power. So within the parenthesis, he refers to the curtain. He can control who can see the beauty of this Duchess. And the fact that it's encapsulated within these parentheses shows that the Duke really, really loves the power that he has over this Duchess. Then he says, they seem to ask me if they durst, if they dare. And what this shows is that the Duke enjoys how fearful people are to ask him about her. Now he references how such a glance, now this intensifier such, emphasizes her beauty, the Duchess's beauty and how captivating her glance is, especially in this image. Moreover, he then refers to, are you to turn and ask thus? Now, here, this is quite ironic because the guest has not asked anything, which shows how deluded the Duke is. He continues, her husband's presence. Now, the alliteration here shows a glimmer of his irritation. He's now starting to build the case up for why he became really, really angry at the Duchess's. Now, he says it wasn't only his presence that called that spot of joy. Now, here he's using a metaphor to emphasize the Duchess's blushing and how uh, pretty and how beautiful she looks when she blushes. However, he's showing his annoyance because he's saying that she wouldn't blush and show maybe some kind of happiness and pleasure. Only in his presence, she'd smile and blush even in other people's presence, which of course irritates him. Moreover, he would then, he gives an example. Fra Pandolf chance to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much. Now mantle is a medieval robe and his reference to Fra Pandolf's words, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much. What the Duke is showing is that the painter basically made a simple comment that her robe covers her wrist too much, which caused the Duchess to blush. Now, what the Duke is showing is just how easily the Duchess was moved by other people, which really irritated him. Moreover, in line 19, he references the half flush that dies. Now, this is wordplay because it has a double meaning. On the one hand, it's showing the Duke illustrating how Fra Pandolf said he can't reproduce her beautiful blush in the image that he's painting. However, the colour that dies along her throat, this is a different meaning as well, and it's alluding to death, and especially death by strangulation. So already the Duke is hinting at the future death of this woman. Moreover, the reference to her throat, this has very ominous connotations of strangulation, being killed through strangulation. Now, the sibilance, such stuff, shows the Duke's growing irritation. Again, he's building a case for why he did end up eventually having his wife killed. Now, in line 20, the reference to courtesy and cause, and in line 21, calling up that spot of joy. The alliteration here shows the Duke's growing sense of anger. Moreover, again, there's the spot of joy mentioned for calling up that spot of joy. Now, what this is showing again is the Duke is revealing to guests that the Duchess was way too friendly to everyone, which really irritated him. Now, the repetition of she, the third person pronoun, shows that the Duke is obsessed with controlling his Duchess. Furthermore, he states, she had a heart, how shall I say? Now, the parenthesis here, the brackets, shows how the Duke is really carefully choosing his words to really justify what he's going to do to the Duchess. Furthermore, the repetition of the intensifiers too soon made glad, too easily impressed. What this is showing is that he found a lot of fault within this Duchess's behavior. Moreover, the rhetorical question, how shall I say? Now, what this shows is that he's really furious. The Duchess did not reserve her emotions exclusively to him. 
Furthermore, he states her looks went everywhere. Now, what this shows is that he's been quite condescending and almost even stating that she was not faithful to him just because she'd be kind to everybody else. She'd blush at the gestures that other people showed her. So let's continue. Sir, it was all one. My favourite at her breast, the drooping of the daylight in the west, the bough of cherry some officious fall broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode around the terrace, all in each would draw from her alike, that proving speech or blush at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such a one and say, just this or that and you disgust me, here you miss. Now, in this part of his monologue, he's showing his increasing anger and annoyance and also he's showing his arrogance. He's stating essentially that he became really, really angry at her because she basically treated him, who comes from a long lineage of very important people, the same way that she would treat other people who he sees, who the Duke sees as very ordinary. Now here, when he states, sir, was all one, this exclamatory sentence shows the Duke's exasperation and irritation. Moreover, he states, my favour at her breast. He essentially is saying here that he would do whatever the Duchess wanted. He's quite arrogant and he's essentially stating, I would do whatever she wanted. Isn't that just what all women want? A Duke like me who's so powerful that will do anything. Now, he then states the dropping of the daylight. Now, the alliteration here shows that she was too easily pleased by what he saw as minor and irrelevant, such as the changing of the day to night. This he saw as not cause enough for her to blush and to be happy. Moreover, the reference to the bough of cherries, then the orchard, then the terrace, the semantic field of nature shows that the Duchess was actually quite innocent, very simple, and she treated everybody the same. Moreover, the Duke talks about the officious fall and this shows us that he's very condescending towards others because he sees himself as so superior. Now in line 29 he states all in each would draw from her alike their proving speech between line 29 and line 30. Now this shows that the Duchess essentially treated everyone, both commoners and royalty, the same way. Something we would see is actually quite admirable for someone who's powerful. Actually the Duke looked down on this kind of treatment. Furthermore, he states, this would also trigger a blush in her. Now this, once more, is an indirect reference back to half flush in line 19. Now the Duchess thanked men, but thanked somehow. Now the repetition of thanked shows the Duchess was actually quite polite, but the Duke saw this as a shortcoming. Moreover, the caesura, or rather the parenthesis here, shows that the Duke is pausing to emphasise his anger. Furthermore, his reference to my gift of a 900 years old name, this shows just how pompous the Duke is. He believes he's of a superior pedigree based on his family and social rank. Then he questions, who to stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Now, stoop means to lower, and essentially the doc Duke is asking, who would bother denouncing this behaviour? Furthermore, the reference to this sort of trifling, this rhetorical question, is essentially the Duke's way of really building up his case to show how perfectly justified he is in his actions. Furthermore, the parenthesis, which I have not in speech, this shows that he's trying to be deliberately self-deprecating, but it's not really working. He really is quite full of himself and he thinks very highly of himself. So let's carry on. Or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours for sooth and made excuse, even then would be some stooping and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whenever I passed her. But who passed without much the same smile? The screw? I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will please you rise? We'll meet the company below, then I repeat, the Count, your master's no munificence. Now here, he refers to if he were to perhaps turn around and state he's not really happy and if she let herself be less than so, it's now in line 39 to 40. Now the sibilant sounds here, she, herself, lessened so. What the sibilant sounds suggest is that the Duke felt the Duchess was quite insolent and she didn't listen and she was very hard to control. 
then he states, I choose never to stoop. Now, what this shows us is the Duke has a very fragile ego who's keen to show that he's above asking the Duchess to change her behaviour as he sees this as a sign of weakness. Moreover, he refers to how she smiled. Oh, sir, she smiled. And the sibilance here shows he's annoyed. She smiled at him in the same way as she smiled to everybody else. Furthermore, he asks, who passed without much the sm same smile? Again, this rhetorical question further builds up his case. She's almost in his eyes cheating on him because she treats everybody in the same way. Then he confesses, this screw, I gave commands. Now the Sinderton here reveals he ordered her execution and then all smiles stopped together. Now this euphemism and the sibilance that's used here is quite ominous. This shows the very sinister side to the Duke. He's built up his case and now he feels really justified in revealing that actually this was cause enough to kill her. Then after that confession he states, there she stands as if alive. Now this simile repeats and reflects the simile in line two, but now it's far more sinister. It's come into full circle. We now realize she looks as if she were alive because she is dead and it's because the Duke had ordered her death. Then he asks, what well, please do you rise? Now this rhetorical question again is an order. He almost moves on after he's confessed this killing. Now here he refers to the Count, your master. Now we learn through this that the listener who the Duke has been confessing this killing to of his previous wife was actually sent by the Count to arrange a new marriage, which is really, really chilling because what this shows us is that the Duke, maybe perhaps the next wife is going to receive the same treatment, she's going to be killed, but equally this shows just how lightly the Duke holds killing this Duchess. Moreover, the reference to munificence means generosity. So he's essentially thanking the guest for just how generous his boss is, the Count, for agreeing to his upcoming marriage. So let's continue. Is ample warrant that no just pretense for mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fed daughter's self, as I have vowed, that starting is my object? Nay, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which Claus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. Now, this final part of the stanza of this dramatic monologue, firstly, as I mentioned, he's talking to about dowry. Dowry is the payment that traditionally men used to pay in exchange for marrying a woman. And this comes from Victorian customs, whereby women were seen as property and the properties of their father. Therefore, men would have to pay dowry to buy this property off their father. Now, his reference to dowry, which will be disallowed, this alliteration is quite alarming because essentially we learn here that the Duke is arranging payment for his next marriage. Moreover, he alludes to the Count's fair daughter's self. Now, the reference to her being fair shows that he believes that the Count's daughter is quite beautiful, so he's looking forward to this new marriage. Moreover, he states that starting is my object. Now, the mention my object shows that the Duke already sees his new wife as a done deal and she's yet another possession to add to his vast collection of possessions. Then he switches topic. He states, notice Neptune though. Now, the alliteration here shows that the Duke is casually changing topic from talking about killing his previous wife to talking about his upcoming marriage. And now he's showing off yet another possession. The reference to Neptune taming a seahorse. Now, this sculpture, which depicts him taming a seahorse, reinforces the Duke's wish to control and dominate women, which reflects the Duke's own wish to have controlled that previous duchess, and he ultimately exercises control by killing her. Furthermore, he does another form of name dropping, Claus of Innsbruck. Again, this is a fictional sculpture. However, what this is showing is that the Duke is showing off the exclusivity of his possessions and how just only important people create all of these possessions for him. Furthermore, the exclamatory sentence, this final exclamatory sentence shows just how pompous the Duke is. He has a great amount of ego and he's extremely vain. So that's all. If you found this video useful, do note that we have an in-depth extensive course covering all the texts and poems in parts 1, 2 and 3 of the Pearson Edexcel International GCSE Anthology. So make sure you sign up for this course for explanations on all the texts as well as model answers. But also check out our website which is www.firstreeteachers.com where you'll find plenty of English revision worksheets, model answers and online courses covering all the major English syllabuses including Edexcel, AQA and IGCSE. Thanks so much for watching.